I'm Philip Either, Curator for Performing Arts here at the Walker Art Center, and um, sitting with me is Sue Weil, who was the first curator for no, no. First, the director of Performing Arts. N yes, co coordinator. coordinator. I wasn't even a director. <laughs> we did not give those good titles and in those the, days. This is the good uh, history <laughs> that we want to talk about, and also in, in the context of our um, about to welcome the White Oak Dance Project with their project, Pass Forward, which looks back to the days of the Judson Dance Theater period and um, that seminal period of postmodern dance um, in the early and mid 60s. Uh, Suzanne, I'd like to first ask you just if you could give us a little bit of that sense of your history here at the Walker from the time you began as a member of the Center Arts Council, which was a council really advising um, the Walker on perform and performing arts projects to the point where you became the coordinator and, and how that transition happened. Oh, I'll try to keep it <laughs> <laughs> terse. <laughs> um, the, the Center Arts Council was one of the great institutions of American history and the arts, I think, <laughs> when I think back about it now. Um, it was a bunch of interesting, interested, I interesting and interested people who had a particular um, interest but not necessarily a professional connection with something, right. be it architecture, jazz, certainly the architecture committee was full of architects, but the jazz committee was full of, you know, physicists and people like that. And there was a, uh, a music committee that did new music and, the, and there were, you know, there were people who would bring Buckminster Fuller here. And the Walker budget gave the Center Arts Council some enormous amount of money, like $10,000 a year to do their stuff, and then they could raise or something, you know, charge. But we didn't go out and fundraise in those and days. These were volunteers. So these were all volunteers, and it was, but it was different than the normal volunteer groups that you see in museums now, or even then. It was more men than women, hmm. and it was very loosely put together in a way, but did incredibly wonderful things in, in a very professional way. So there, before there was a Guthrie building, there were uh, a lot of events in the art center and in the park where the where the Guthrie is now. Right. For example, a Fourth of July picnic that was an annual event with a with bands and music and stuff happening and a stilt walking Uncle Sam and things uh, for the kids and right. all of that. And it was was a very uh, you know the Idea House had been there and all sure. of that. So it was all very um, you know let's have a show. And I happen to be always, for some unknown reason, in my growing up in Minneapolis, became obsessed about jazz. I just loved jazz. And my florist, Jerry Palmer, knew that I loved jazz. And for some reason, he was on this, for whatever reason, on, this, on the Center Arts Council. And you, had, you were invited on. It wasn't a, you, you, so I was invited. It was a great moment in my life. And I was with the jazz committee. There was also an opera committee. And Norton Hintz started, uh, was the, the mover and shaker there, and he had lived all over in small, small and big cities in, in Europe, as physicists are wont to do, you know, go, moving around. And they all had little chamber opera companies. So that was the genesis of what then was the center opera. And it was in the umbrella here. And Martin Friedman said, this is a digression, but Martin said, if you're going to have an opera company out of the museum, then you better have artists to do the designs right. and costumes and, sit and things. And so that's how Robert Israel was born, who was yeah. here as a visual artist and had no sure. intention of ever designing. And I just mm -hmm. saw him, he's designing Falstaff at the Santa Fe Opera wow. with Jonathan Miller directing. I mean, that's where he's <laughs> gone. And it was really all Martin. Martin con convinced him to do that. So, the op so my husband was involved with the opera committee and they were doing these little chamber operas. By that time, the Guthrie was built, and we had the use of it on its dark nights. So I sort of, the, the, once, the Guthrie, once the Guthrie was there, the Walker then hired a coordinator of performing arts, and that was a man named John Ludwig, who uh, unfortunately died a couple years ago. He had come right out, out of Yale, and he was mostly an opera buff. Okay. Uh, he, Did he manage the Center Opera Company? He did eventually, but he came here as the coordinator of performing arts, and he didn't pretend to or care much about anything about pop music like jazz or any right. of that stuff. Yeah. 
but he was very um, cultured in the serious arts and certainly about opera. So he brought Wes Balk here and he brought a lot of other people and he did. And um, there was less and less need for the Center Arts Council because there was a professional. I mean, sure. we were dealing right. with a union house and, you know, 1,400 was the, seats. Was the Center Arts Council, was there a crossover with the Board of Directors of the Walker? Or uh, was there was some, I think. Yeah. Yes, I think so. And uh, did Mickey and, uh, did, did Martin um, have a final say over what the choices no, would No, not really. Uh -huh. He was, um, I think a lot of things, uh, probably there were things he looked askance. <laughs> but I think, no, no. And they came to everything and they, Mickey got involved with the opera company. I remember her sewing during the second act, during the, during the first act for the costumes for the second act. Uh, uh -huh. There were all these women standing, sitting in the backstage with their sewing machines. I mean, that, that was a whole other right. story. But when, when the opera company got too big, uh, and, and that's why this is relevant, I guess. When the opera company got too big, uh, it was clearly you know, beyond what the Martin thought he had bargained for, and it really needed, it was having its own board of directors. So it spun off and John spun with it. Right. And so there, w there was nobody. And we would say to John, bring John Coltrane. And he'd say, who's John Coltrane? And right. we'd say, just bring John Coltrane. <laughs> and, and that's how uh, the, we did the jazz concerts. Oh, and, wow. and I had gotten this to be head of the jazz committee or something. And then I was president of the, arts, uh, the Center Arts Council, which was n a much dwindled organization uh -huh. by then. And so one day out of the blue, Martin Friedman called me in and said, how would you like to run the performing arts now that John's left and of course it wouldn't be an opera company you know come a couple right. days a week and we'll pay you by the hour and huh. I was totally stunned it's 1970? this was 68 60. end of 68 uh -huh. and I was still going back to school and all right. kinds of stuff and uh, and was it from the public's point of view or from your point of view even at that point did it seem that performing arts had an important place at the table at the Walker? Yes, I think it always, um, w we all took the art center part of the title. It was not the Walker Museum, right. it was the Walker Art Center, and we knew that. And it had, had this tradition of, of I mean, of, of people readings. coming and, yes, poetry readings. And even when artists were brought here, when Duchamp came, it right. was, there was a sort of element of performance in right. some of those talks. And Martin has a great sense of theatricality and right. showbiz and loved all of that. So when we were doing, you know, these wonderful concerts, even before I remember a symposium that the Center Arts Council did called Making Theater Seats More Uncomfortable. <laughs> and I think Richard Schechner and right. uh, all kinds of people came and there, um, and the Firehouse Theater was there and they did a little performance piece before this symposium broke for lunch where Sidney Walter, who was then the head of it, took all his clothes off. and. Um, <laughs> was body painted and his people served apples to everybody in the audience, you know, it was that right. kind of happening. Sure. But that was way before, that was in the mid-60s. Uh -huh. So there were uh -huh. things like that going on. And I think Martin, you know, got, got a kick out of it and didn't want the tail to wag the dog. Right. <coughs> because, you know, seriously, it was a place about visual arts, sure. but it was, it, it always had a place at the table. Did you, it seems that the program then, from the time you were, began as, as coordinator, um, really in some ways took off in terms of the scale of it and the amount of activity. I look back at, in wonder at knowing that you were mostly a one-person staff. Um, I showed you this list of programming in the 73, 74, 75. There were um, well over 100 events in a year, yeah, concert yeah. and, and a, whole, a wide range of programming, concerts, dance, performance work. How did you, um, how did you develop the program and how did you um, how did you manage all that programming with, with a small, in a small uh, staff or no staff? No staff, actually no staff. I finally got an intern after a while. Um, w but that wasn't exactly true because there were the bookkeepers who did the sure. bookkeeping and there right. was the design department that did the right. design stuff. And so, I mean, I didn't a have to deal staff. with it. There was a technical staff right. and the museum took care of all of that yeah. and, and, or the art center. And so that was... You know, I, 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 and all I was expected to do was break even at the end of the year. I really didn't have a budget, but I did have the use of the Guthrie on it with a, without rent, I think, uh -huh. on its dark night. And if, I think our tickets were six fifty, eight fifty, uh -huh. things like right. that. Right. But I was able to bring, you know, the Beach Boys and Miles Davis and, and Elton John, and my so first two concerts were the Led Zeppelin and the Who. 
Right. And at $2,500, <laughs> I paid the Led Zeppelin. The Who, I paid 4500 because they had just, from the time I booked them at 25, they came out with Tommy. Oh, and they said, right. you know, we think it's going to be a hit. Can we do two shows? And, uh, and I paid them 4500 and picked them up at the airport <laughs> and, you know, had them back to my house afterwards. And, and you know, it was you, all did simple you have any time. trouble with, uh, I mean, at that point, there, oddly enough, there didn't seem to be as much a distinction between commercial, say, pop music. No, not at and all. And art-related right. art right. performance right. or dance. Um, did, no one said, hey, why is a museum booking a big rock band? Because at that point, they were sort of the edge of... Yeah, they, they, weren't, they weren't necessarily making lots of money yet right. in those days. Yeah. And I think that the other bookers of... Um, rock and roll right. were not happy, some uh, of them. Uh, but because a nonprofit was. Yeah, sort of yeah. yeah. But we were taking that money and recycling it back into to Meredith and Mago sure. Mines and Twyla right. and yeah. Merce and John and all that. But there was um, one of the things that I I, I, I had no system at all. <laughs> I really, it was, it was really. Mickey and Judy, let's have a show. I mean, somebody would call and say, so-and-so is going to be coming through between Chicago and somewhere uh, six weeks from now. You want them? Yeah, let's right. do that. As the guy, I'd call the Guthrie and find out if the date was available. Right. And, you know, we'd get the tickets printed and there'd be a show. Right. And uh, it, was, it, it, it was amazing to have things happen so fast. I mean, right. we did very little planning ahead. I never sat and budgeted much out. Uh, mir uh, some you miracle curatorially over these choices like, no oh, are they good? not are they usually good? I uh, I learned from Ellen Stewart something where she said the beeps were right I had right. I, I, I don't I really don't know much but I have really good beeps <laughs> I have a very good gut <laughs> so I went with that I, right. I did I just uh, I, I saw two little words about Johnny winter when he was just starting yeah. and I couldn't find him he wasn't booked by anybody I called Bill Graham <laughs> Hi, I'm, uh, right. and he he told me later when I met him that he said he put the phone away like this and he said should I tell her or shouldn't I is she a good person or a bad I'll tell her <laughs> and he and and he did and it was just uh, um, one of the things that I had the best thing I had going for me um, to make this is mostly about the rock but other stuff there was a really smart bunch of people at the electric fetus uh -huh. Right. And my God, when I was invited in the basement to smoke dope with the guys of the, I mean, I was a suburban housewife. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it was uh, it was my great moment. And they had their finger on the pulse. Of they the knew uh, exactly what was right. going and what was coming up. There were people who worked here. Uh, there were artists who were guards, who also had. Right. Christopher Finch was here. He had just come from London. He knew. Right. Um, there was um, the artists that came through. Right. Um, it was. It was visual artists as well as yeah oh yeah dancers. yes yes and I mean I remember Bob Israel was the first person who told me about Phil Glass uh -huh. and then Phil Glass told me about Mabo Mines because right. his wife then was in Mabo Mines and I went over and and met Joanne and Lee Brewer the first time uh -huh. and I you know and I went to see something they did at either the Whitney or the Guggenheim. And they were sort of sponsored then by La Mama, right. and Ellen Stewart came out. And she's one of the forgotten people of yeah, no, of, uh, of the performing arts world, I think. And it breaks, kind of breaks my heart. Yeah. Um, she was great. Nobody would have come to see Mabo Mines if it hadn't been that Ellen Stewart was bringing them and going to be there and ring her bell. Because uh -huh. that they've heard of, oh. but they hadn't they heard of Mama's name. They knew La Mama, and they didn't know anything. Mabel Mines had just moved from France. They hadn't. They didn't. They had done a couple things in New York, right. and you know that was all. Mm -hmm. So I had that, and the other thing was when I was in New York, a, a couple of times, Martin um, was there meeting with artists, and he would invite me to the artist lofts okay. with him, and I would go look at the record collections <laughs> <laughs> because I felt always very strongly that the that the Music, music and performing arts had to be in line with what the museum did on the walls right. and on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> because um, I ha if there was, uh, the one thing I know I brought to the job was a real reverence for this place. It right. was the oasis of, I mean, I got married in the early 50s, and Minneapolis was not, um, it, it was always better than most cities of its side, but it was pretty dull. There wasn't yeah. much going on here. And the, whatever, whatever was lively was happening here at the Walker. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I brought my child here. I mean, it, it, was, it, was, uh, it was the oasis. And I felt I had a sense of what was 
Right. So John Denver lived in Minnesota for a while. He wanted to perform at the Guthrie more than anything. No way for me, for right. the walker. Yeah. So the Guthrie brought him, which was right. appropriate. Uh -huh. But I, I mean, there, I, I did have a sense of that. So yes, Frank Zappa, but no, right. you know, somebody else. Yeah. Right. And there were people that we brought every year, like Zappa or Miles Davis, the people that I thought were really seminal right. in their field that sure. matched in a, some kind of, at least correlated some way with the yeah. other. Can you tell me about your first experience, I mean, your, your involvement then with dance? Um, oh, those were... I am leading toward the questions around, you know, the awareness around the artists um, of, uh, that were involved with the Judson dance space and um, what your sense of that scene was during that time. Well, you remember that the Walker was going to open in 71. Right. And... Um, they started to tear the building down at kind of late 80, 68, and that's when I started. So we, as uh, you know, as you know, I, we did things all over the city in that period. Both the visual arts and the performing arts were spread out everywhere. And it was uh, certainly the highly political time and the breaking the rules time and all of that. And I wanted, I kept saying I wanted to make a statement with the opening show, or the opening uh, uh, of the of the the opening events, we did many 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 things. Um, uh, I had uh, well to backtrack. Th those were halcyon days in the dance world, and I started to book dance right away because the dance touring program at the National Endowment for the Arts, which was the best thing the National Endowment for the Arts ever did, was this wonderful program, and there was a huge list of people who were eligible for subsidy, and if you booked them. Um, you would get your, I think the fee, there, there, were, there were two things. There were two, try, of course, dance companies don't have homes, so they, they're on the road, so they need, they need help getting on the road, number one. Number two, they wanted to get away from one night stands. Right. So you could, you could book for no less than a half week, which is two and a half days, or for as long as you want. I mean, we brought right. Tharp for a month yeah. with the subsidy. And then the states, almost all the states joined in. So if one of them was subsidizing a third, the state might be subsidizing a fourth, which meant that the outlay was very small. Right. I mean, you had to take care of all the costs once they got sure. here. But that was enormous incentive. Mm. So I wasn't any more interested in dance than I was in theater or music or anything. Right. But, I, but it was so much easier to bring dance. And of course, and, and dance was bubbling up. Sure. But I think, that, I think that it was synergistic. I don't, I don't know if the bubbling came right. better than sure. the, what, how that happened. Do you remember what some of your first dance commitments were? I think that Merce, I think that John had already booked a Merce. We always did, Merce had been here many times. And, yeah. and Merce came here in the Volkswagen bus days uh, at, to the, we talk about this a lot, to the Women's Club, right. which has a stage about the size of these two chairs, you know, and in performed. In I think. I, whenever. Yeah. And right. I just remember that a friend of ours called and said, there's this thing happening. And I had vaguely heard of him. Hmm. And... Um, we went to the and, and Rauschenberg was doing the sets and knocking on the wall, had knocking on the walls and doing sound pieces that way, and I just remember saying, I don't know what this is, but whatever it is, I want some of it. I mean, I just, I, 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 I can't believe that now I, you know, I work with Merce, I'm vice chair of the board, and right. we've worked together a lot over the years, and we've become very good friends. And, but that was the turning point in my life, right. I think. That was what really, and I don't think the Walker had anything to do with the bringing of him then. They no, in fact, there's this letter at the opening of the uh, ex exhibition, Art Performs Life, Merce's section. Mm -hmm. Dernberger, is that, who was the director of the Walker? Or, um, before Martin. Um, uh, no, um, but I can't remember. And, well, the director then had a letter from Merce, um, typewritten. Yes, um, I've seen that. Saying, you know, we, a friend of mine, John mm -hmm. Cage, and I would like to come and perform at the Walker. Right. He, he had scribbled over it, you know, we don't do this kind of thing. Right, right. And then right. right next to it was a letter, uh, three years later or whatever, from Martin, you know, basically welcoming. Mm -hmm. know, um, mm -hmm. and it was in that early Yes. Martin, uh, Martin got it right away. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if Sage had something to do even uh -huh. back then oh. with, uh, with it coming to right. this. Uh, I, she's never, I can never pin her down yeah. about it. I've asked her, but I, I wouldn't be, because she knew him back when she was a dancer uh -huh. at, and at the University of Wisconsin. And, right. 
and he tells about seeing her the first time that uh. he saw her in a cute hat and what how gorgeous and you know <laughs> so they they've had this long romance which is so nice um, so we started um, um, I had I I knew a little bit not much and I hadn't seen much um, about the, uh, Yvonne was the first one I really knew anything about. And Merce was here on a residency. And I was driving downtown, and Valda Setterfield asked me if she could ride downtown with me. She was going Valda to a movie. Was a dancer with Merce's she company. was a dancer with Merce's company, and she's married to David Gordon. Right. And David was one of the original oh, people. Sure. And will, is, will be all involved in, in your residency, because right, sure. he directed and wrote and right. threw those three pieces, I think, of his. In, the, in this evening. And she, I said to her, do you know how I can find Yvonne Rayner? And she said, well, my husband dances with, him, with her. And I thought, this exotic creature has a husband? Right. Oh, my God. <laughs> and so she put me in touch with Yvonne. And Yvonne was then, it was called Yvonne Rayner and Dance, Dancers. And it, maybe 67? Maybe yeah, 67. this would have been about 68, 69. Right. And Yvonne was booked through the New York Review of Books, had a booking agency. Uh -huh. And they had a full page ad about all the people that they, I'd love to find one of those again. And Yvonne Rayner and Dancers was one of them. So I called the New York Review of Books. Oh, really? And uh, arranged with, and I don't remember the sequence, but I do remember going to New York to Yvonne's loft on Green Street when Soho was a, a deserted, uh, illegal place to live. Right. And I had been. Uh, you know, at artist lofts and things uh, there before, but boy, it was spooky to go there at night. And Yvonne and David and I think Trisha and several of the grand, the right. people that became the Grand sure. Union were there to talk about coming to the Walker for the opening in 71. I kept saying to myself, this is the statement I want to make, because I knew they were breaking all the rules. Right. And and then there then there's the terrible endowment story about them. Do you want to hear that? Sure. Yes, of course. Well, and I have to ask you uh, before. Well, no, you tell me that story first, then I'll. Okay. Tell you. Well, what happened was we were getting subsidy from the NEA and from the yeah. State Arts Council, and uh, they changed the name to the Rio Grande Union, right. and then the Grand Union, and yeah. we we went through all of these. And the, I would sit there with them with a clipboard. I was such an idiot, and they would say. Uh, Yvonne would say, I need 100 red rubber balls. And I'd say, okay. <laughs> and David would say, I need 14 old men's raincoats. And I would say, okay. And they, they said they were so astounded. You know, they thought, who is this woman? She's, She's actually going to do this. Stuff. And I did. I killed myself. And, um, but before they came, there was this rehearsal at the Smithsonian. This is a famous piece of American performing arts history. There was some kind of a, a, a showing. I, I think it wasn't even a pu public showing at the Smithsonian. At, this is the height of you know the Vietnam in stuff in Washington. And Steve Paxton took his clothes off and put himself into a flag. Or maybe they all did Yvonne's flag piece. I don't know. But anyway. Um, it was a big cause celeb, uh. and the I got a call from the State Arts Council saying to take the endowment's name off of it, and I said, I will not take the endowment's name off of it unless the endowment tells me. So right. the woman that was in charge of the en endowment dance program, June Airy, a nice woman, called and said, well, you know, Sue, we know it's okay for you because... Um, but it's the other sponsors. Be, w you know, we'll give you the money, but please take the endowment's name off of it. Really? Yes. And I said, you know, June, it's not a problem because people have been taking their clothes off at the Walker for years, and we don't have a flag. <laughs> <laughs> Which was true. We may have had a flag, but I don't know. It wasn't prominent. So, um, and, and it was funny because I knew that the, that the Grand Union did not have any other bookings. This was right. their big booking yeah. of the year. So we, um, and it ended up with the state also taking their name off of it. So I said, sure, I'll take your name off of it. And then I called Mike Steele. <laughs> <laughs> and he wrote it all up. I mean, it was, it was, we were defiant in those days. And of course, what happened was they came, they worked with the community in the way that those people did and which you'll see in White Oak sure. because they're working with community right. people again. And that was such a, it was done in, 
not in a gratuitous, we've got to please the foundation that's giving us money sure, by involving right. the community. None of that was, everything was done for really simple, pure reasons, right. if I can be so yeah. um, cynical about today. Uh, not here, but most places, certainly. And so it was all, all these people came and showed up. I mean, Jessica Lang lived here and was mm. a kid right. at the Guthrie, and she was in, I think, Yvonne's piece and maybe one of really? Trisha's, and yeah. all these people from all walks of life came and they did performances from day till night. There wasn't anything that could offend Jesse Helms that they did. Right. And it wasn't because they were watching themselves, it was just wasn't what they were doing sure. then. I mean, they, right. and they, right. they all did works all over the city on the lakes and Loring Park. There's some wonderful photographs of people on barges that Trisha Brown did. Right. Sure. And um, there was a guy from San Francisco that nobody, I've never heard or seen it since, named Dong. I don't know where he came from. Yeah. He was a friend of Yvonne's. So it wasn't just the Judson people. There were a bunch of other people that came a, as part of that group. But, but among the Judson people were Trisha, David, Yvonne, um, and many of the other people that you're going to see with White Oak, right. I had never seen perform uh -huh. right. or didn't really, I knew about them, but I would say that most people had never seen had their, seen. their yeah. work. Well, there's a, to go back a few years, there is, we were digging in our archives and we found a letter from John Ludwig, um, a number of letters to Steve Paxton in uh -huh. the uh -huh. mid-60s. Right. And then, and it was about perhaps mm -hmm. back when they were still sort of under, working under that rough name of Judson, mm -hmm. of maybe, there seemed to be some interest or exploration mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. their coming. Um, and then, Someone from the Walker, it might have been John, but clearly somebody went to see Nine Evenings, mm -hmm, the technology mm -hmm, dance mm -hmm, mm -hmm. collaboration. And there's a very interesting letter from John saying, we were really disappointed in the evening. And oh, yes. That, oh, yes. Uh, we felt like the technology and the, the, um, the apparatus and, and uh, the lack of production and also the, even the promotion really didn't serve you well. And we, you know, we want to stay in touch with you. But let's look to future things, something oh, else. Oh, how interesting. And, uh, and I didn't, you know, it, so that was our first, because I specifically asked our, like, our archivist if, you know, what our history mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. with the Judson era dancers. And um, then that led clearly, uh, I mean, that was one point in time which had mm -hmm. its own close. Mm -hmm. And then within a few years, obviously Grand Union developed mm -hmm. out of mm -hmm. um, Judson. Right. Um, there seemed to be a break of a few years where yeah. people went off and did yeah. their own thing. Yeah, I think so. Things. Um, but um, at that time, in the early to mid '60s, it wasn't like in the Twin Cities. People were really aware of these artists. Oh no, 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 no! Read about them. People weren't them in New come. York very much. It was right. still a very small coterie of people, and and you know there and uh, you know there were many, many visual artists as well as performing artists involved in this because visual artists in those days were performers too, like Rauschenberg and Whitman and, and Jasper Johns. M M Morris and Johns, and they were right. Johns and 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 uh, Rauschenberg were a part of Merce's company, and yeah. then they all did performances together, and a lot of them were married to each other in those days. Right. So um, Simone Forti was married both to Robert Morris and to Robert Whitman at different times. Oh, really? And, um, the, you know, they, they were, and, and I think that they all performed together. So they were, they were sparking off of each other, right. the, those worlds. And it was a very, you know, interesting, yeasty time. And I, I'm not even sure who all the rest of them yeah. were that were doing this, but those right. are the names that come to my mind right and away. In 1971, when the new building opened, um, your invitation for them to come the idea to do more of a residency rather mm -hmm. than just come and let's right. see Grand Union perform, right. that seemed to be that, and in 75 when you had them come back, seemed to be, at least from how I've s followed history, kind of ahead of its time, the idea of, you know, it's not just going to be uh, a three-day residency. Right. You're going to be here for two weeks doing right. stuff all over town. Right. Everybody gets right. a chance to do right. their own performance right. pieces. How did you construct that? Or well, we had, when we started to, to do the dance touring program, uh, yeah. We started to work with the schools, we started to work with the university, such as it was in those days with the dance yeah. program and so on. And with other dance companies, with Lois and whoever, Nancy, want, Hauser. Nancy Hauser, whoever right. wanted whatever. And we would kind of give the pros first pick of having the people come over and, so and when right. it was the appropriate people in the appropriate time. So we had that, that kind of modus right. <coughs> to work. but. But for the Grand Union, uh, they pretty much, uh, 
I don't remember specifically with them, but with everybody else, I had a grant from the Bush Foundation that subsidized uh, the, the program, ma the making of new work and that right. sort of thing, which yeah. was a wonderful thing. And one of the things that allowed me to do is bring the choreographers uh, or the theater person or right. whoever to come to Minneapolis ahead of time, uh, maybe oh. a couple of months before, uh -huh. you know, we did things on a short leash. Sure. Um, and look all over oh. to and and pick their spaces huh. and pick what they wanted to do and meet some people before so for example one of the things I'm proudest of was we were doing um uh, we, I think the first Twyla Tharp residency she was going to do the 100s and she needed to train a hundred people in the community right. yes. and uh, so I took her uh, all day. You know, she's impossible. We went everywhere, and she didn't like anything. And then we went to the old firehouse, which is now the Firehouse Theater, which was an abandoned firehouse. It had a, a hearse or an ambulance inside of it. It was filthy. It was a mess, but it was owned, owned by a woman named Gloria Siegel, yeah. who was a, on the city council either then or later. And she was going to make it into a Chinese restaurant, I think. Right. It was going to be, and it, the university had really just been in the process of expanding over to the West Bank. So I called her and said, can we have it? I mean, Minneapolis was like that. Right. I called Negley Outdoor and said, can we have billboards for Merce? And they said, <laughs> okay, you know, and so we had billboards. I mean, right. we were just, it, people were so, Open people were open and uh, and not afraid of anything, so we did um, for for Twyla, which is now what you're asking about. But we opened; they cleaned it up for us, yeah. fixed the locks on the door, gave us the key, and then when when uh, what about Jack Ruler, who yeah, I'm right. actually distantly related to, came to sh from Chicago, yeah. uh, I said, "Go get it before uh, they turn it into a Chinese restaurant." I was really proud and of that. It's now Patrick's Cabaret. Oh, it is. Yeah, Patrick has moved his space to the old, where the old firehouse. Is. Well, I thought that was where Firehouse Theater is. Oh, I mean, not the firehouse. Blood, I mean, mixed blood, blood. I mean, oh, that's the firehouse. That's oh, that, yeah, firehouse. that firehouse. That firehouse. Uh huh. On Lake Street. That was also used. No, this was this was the one okay. that's mixed blood. Right, sure. <coughs> anyway, so we did we did these. I suppose it was ahead of its time. But then, because of the dance touring program and because of these residencies and because you were encouraged to have community involvement right. we we were we were into the that mm. swing of things do you remember any um, David Gordon is quoted in Sally Baines's book about the Walker residency how important it was to Grand Union the, the, in 71 mm -hmm. how but also how difficult um, that, that how new they were to get going out of town oh. do you remember things about oh yes oh yes <laughs> uh, we had a big house uh, I mean but not that big but we had a, a, a big 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 enough house in in the country in Minnesota and we had land and there was places for people to spread out and so and there was no money to house them really right. so they all stayed at my house um, and uh, it was wild because they were having such a good time some of them decided to stay a second week and my husband and I went to Chicago and after that we devised the five-day rule you can come for five days right. the first five the second five but uh, <laughs> but not but not all ten days right. I was just too awful and um, and and they were up uh, there was more Sturm and Drang going on in that living room at, late at night uh -huh. and God right. knows what else was going on in that living room late at night um, while they were dealing with their various angsts and uh, right. and I'm sure com competitive things. Oh know, yeah, are difficult. As they, and right. There's such so many. It's kind of remarkable, and I don't know what you might attribute it to, but the fact that both with Judson and then later on with Grand Union. I mean, when we look back now, people like David Gordon, Trisha Brown, um, Lucinda Childs, mm -hmm. um, uh, Yvonne Rainier, and Steve Paxton, and all these artists. The fact that so much diverse talent could mm -hmm. be one right. group of people, right, um, right, and and still be able to figure out how to work together as a right. collective. Uh, well, uh, and and Yvonne was was moving from being the lead person to to one of the gang. Was she here? As oh a yes, oh yes, yes, yes. She was definitely here as part of this, and she was wonderful. And so they all did the. She did this piece with the red rubber balls, and that was the only thing Mark never stopped us. But and he doesn't remember this, but I certainly do. The piece was that she and some of the community people would walk through the museum, stand in front of a picture, and then drop red rubber balls. <laughs> members of, of Grand Union, or no, even just members of the community, community. Uh -huh. right? And Martin did not like those red rubber balls r rolling around right, in his sure. galleries, and right. he was right. And so yeah. that we stopped that. But we had huge crates in the in the front lobby where the bookstore is 
with um, if, uh, maybe the final where they all performed together that were filled with leaves and newspapers uh, and there are pictures of them crawling right. all over and all that. We've got some great videotape footage of that. You uh, do? Yeah. Oh, I'd love to see yeah, some of that. of that. I think it was may have been the 75 residency of because we, in the lobby. We almost never performed in the galleries. The only thing I ever had here in a gallery was a, an, a David Tudor installation because it was between shows. And the first person that I, I mean, n nothing turned me off was somebody that came to see me that said, hi, I want to do a dance among the sculpture. Right. They yeah. were, um, those were short meetings. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> there was this one little tape we have of Merce in the company performing around Mario yes. Metz's. Um, yes, uh, on Mario Metz. And that was, that was fine. But that was Merce, and you right. know, uh, yes, and that, now, that was a wonderful because exhibition. Because we have not figured out exactly how to combine performance and galleries in, in any real I don't, I think they're, I, I mean, I think once in a while it's appropriate and, right. and, and it works, but most of the time it's a gimmick and it's yeah. silly right. and all of that. But I, I, I have to say, going back to the Judson, that I've been involved with this since the beginning, since the genesis sure. of the idea, and then I with haven't had forward, with Pass Forward, yeah. and I haven't. But I had I had never seen Steve Paxton's work. Huh. I had never seen Simone's. Huh. Before I, you saw the Pass Forward. Yeah. Oh wow. And wow. most people didn't. Right. Um, sure. Some of those pieces I had not. Uh, I had never seen Lucinda's. I'd seen Lucinda's work, but I had never seen the the piece that. Uh, uh, the solo that is called oh, Carnation, Carnation yeah. uh, before. I mean, I had heard, yeah. I had never seen Trio A really, really until the Judson, right. until yeah. we went back to the Judson for this, the, which is the genesis. I suppose you want to go to that. Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm in love with Rod Besser, who was who used to dance with, Dancer. with uh, well, no, he was with Laura, actually, and then he was with White Oak when I started okay. to work with White Oak. Right. He's just the, one of the loveliest people in the world. and. And he and I had a dinner date, and we were going to go, and he said, how about going to the Judson? They're having a, a kind of reunion uh -huh. performance. Uh -huh. And I said, sure. I mean, I, right. it was terrific. And then Misha heard about this, and he and Rob are really good friends, and he said, well, we'll come too. So he and, and Lisa... you already had a long relationship with Misha. I'd had a long relationship yeah. with Misha. I met Misha very early on, and, and, uh, and then in the last few years, I've been, I did some touring, booking working stuff for him, Oak working with White Oak, um, some U.S. Tour, tours, and we've just become closer, closer friends. I adore him more than just, except for my family. <laughs> and um, so the four of us went, and, and, they, and they did David Gordon's chair piece, which of course I'd seen many times, and which is done on the stage many times, yeah. and uh, in various permutations. And they did, well, a bunch of other works, but then Yvonne's uh, Trio A, and they did it nude with the, with the flags. Uh -huh. Yvonne didn't dance, but she set it up, right. and it was wonderful. And we had a great evening. We went to dinner. I I thought that was really fun. It would never, in a million years, have occurred to me, me the old, you know, the old performing arts right. sure. producer right. type, uh, to say let's do this. Sure. But Misha did. I mean, it mm. was completely a hundred percent his idea. Was he just knocked out by what he said? I think he. He, I think the thing that sets him apart, besides the fact that he's, you know, a god in the way that he can move, is that he is endlessly curious and not afraid of anything. Right. So he knew that, you know, he had heard all about this, which he talks about in the, when he sets up this sure. performance. And I think he, and he had worked with Tricia, he had worked with David, you know, he, he knew a lot of this work, but he, but he didn't know a lot of it, and I think it was a way for him to find it out. And so we, you know, he started to make phone calls. I started, I helped him making phone calls. We found Steve, we found, um, I, Simone lives in LA. I had never met her. She oh, came really? over for dinner. Oh, I had wow. never met her. And um, she still spends a fair amount of time in Vermont too. Oh, does she? Yes, 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 a mad yeah. river. Yeah. 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 And no, but I didn't know her and I got to know her through then. And then she gave me her book and also explained to me, um, and Tricia, who I've known Pretty well over the years. And you supported quite actively here. Yes, I yes I, I we practice. worked with Trisha a few times, yes. and Trisha said that Simone was really the one who got them launched in a uh -huh. way. She was the first person to do a full evening's work of her own work, and she did it at Yoko Ono's studio. Oh, Yoko right, used right. to open her studio for other people before she was with John Lennon, I right. think. Right. Sure. And so 
it was she was the one that kind of gave them the courage. Annie and and Simone was working with the with the visual artists a yeah. lot. And that was before they decided to even launch their first public. I think concert. it was. Yes. I think it was. Yeah. Uh, it may have been before, may have been after. I really don't know what the what that right. timeline yeah. is. So, and you know, I'd heard all this apocryphal stuff about Steve Paxton. I'd sure. seen him when he had danced with Mars, but I hadn't seen any of that work. So, it was really fun to get them together, and it was long meetings with all of them that that uh, I helped Misha with, and that Misha did, uh, talking to them about what they'd want to do. And the first time I met with Simone, and we talked about it, she said, "Well, I don't really want anything on the stage, but I have these two pieces, Scramble and Huddle, and." They can be doing those in the lobby, and they can do them on the stage before the people come in or during right. intermission. And that's what we've done, and they've been fabulous. Uh, and then there's a little video that she sets up for right. each of those. So it was done like that. It was all kind of handwork right, sure. of, of who was going to do what. Uh, and uh, Now, one would think, I mean, I'm sure you've probably heard this, an initial response is Mikhail Baryshnikov, these remarkable dancers with White Oak, Dan White, White Oak mm -hmm. Project, um, they, in their own way, it, it sort of represent a virtuosity, a, an incredible movement. Right, ability. right, right. And then this movement of Justin yes, was yes. really about uh, 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 saying no to virtuosity. So, yes, and, absolutely. And vernacular. And also no to kind yeah. of high ticket prices and right, big right, glamorous right, presentation. Right, right. And, you know, there's people obviously in the field who say, well, this seems like mixing oil and water. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, what, and yet, those that see the work through Pass Forward and get to the performance mm -hmm. critically almost across the board have said, well, somehow it works. And yeah, it, it what, does. What it's it magical. It and did you have your own doubts about it when well, you first thought, well, Misha maybe isn't the dancer to do walk across the stage, you know? <laughs> no, I, because I've, I've watched Misha do, you know, I've, I've, I don't know how many performances right. in the years yeah. that I've been working with them and, and just seeing them. Um, I knew that he could do whatever he set himself up to do, and that if it wasn't right for him, he wouldn't do it. I mean, if anybody has a sense right. of what is appropriate for him. And the the thing that they have, that White Oak has, which is a, a real luxury, but first of all, they have the use of the White, White Oak Plantation, yeah, which has yeah. a and that, uh, Howard Gilman's wonderful yeah. place in Florida. And so there's a studio there, there's housing. So they could bring Yvonne or, yeah. or Deborah yeah. Hay or whoever down there for weeks at a time uh. and work with them. So the dancers not only got to know the the work, but they got to know the people and what was the blood and bones of what these right. were about. Yeah. And they weren't doing strict reconstructions or anything sure. like that, but, right. but they were taught by the by the person Which themselves, is. yes. And did they have resistance at first to say, well, you know, I don't think this makes sense with the philosophy of what Judson era was about. Or no, I I don't think so because be. I I I you know you'd have to ask them, but I know that um, after Steve came back from working with them and then saw it and went to France and performed with them and then right. they pre performed a solo. He didn't do his group pieces or his. Misha did his piece, but right. but and sometimes Steve has and he did a solo. I, there was a party afterwards upstairs at BAM, and I think they all hung out there till about two in the morning. <laughs> I left with Misha at about one, and apparently they were, they, there. All were there they, they were all there, and they all performed. And most of them don't perform very much anymore, but right. they they did, and they and they're still in great shape. They mm. look fabulous. Right. They're all gorgeous, and they were. I think they really got off on it, and I think they. I don't know. I shouldn't say this, maybe, but. I think they're at more at peace with each other now. Right. I mean, there's been a certain, you know, e philosophical differences. Dif of yeah, right. different differences, jealousies. Yeah. Who knows? You know, it, that just sure. happens. But they were they were wonderfully supportive to each other yeah. there, and I think they all just got a big kick out of it. And it was, I mean, I, I was in tears. I think everybody in yeah. that place was. And some of the dances do require virtuosity, um, uh, uh, a, a lot of them, right. uh, doing David's chair piece and sure. doing um, uh, Yvonne's work and uh, Lucinda's um, concerto, which is so gorgeous and that ends the program. Um, but they, I think... And how is... Uh, the, it's, it's about pushing yourself. It's sure. about trying something new. It's right. And has audience re reaction uh, been... People have kind of come to um, this era and these right. innovations now. Well, I think that it, it, it because it's been so well set up. Um, right. I learned something when I left 
here and when, after I left the NEA from here, I went to PBS and I learned uh, something you that... Were, you, were, you were involved with great... I mean, you were running... Um, no, I was, I was, uh, no, I was senior vice president for all of programming. All of programming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was kids and documentaries wow. and news okay. and all that. And I was there for 11 years and it was... Uh, I started with arts and, arts and humanities, was, right. but after about two years I became the head of programming. So I learned a lot about a lot and right. a lot of stuff. And one of the things I learned from um, one of the people from Chicago was that you, you assume that the audience is very smart and knows nothing. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that that's a very good rule even in the performing arts. It would be so unfair to burden an audience with this material without giving them some of the tools right. with which to look at it. What would, as as I remember, my one of my uh, the things that I remember about being in this building and trying, you know, we were pushing the envelope b everywhere, right. was that one of the reactions that was so difficult for people was that they were feeling that they were being put on. Right. You know. There was a that, over yes, there. exactly, that there was an in-crowd that this was for and that they right. were being laughed at because they didn't get it. Right. And, uh, and, and the, uh, very intimidating. Um, and so I think it's very important to be able to give people whatever, they, whatever tools they need. And this was originally done without the, the completed videotape that you see, and it's a little bit lighter in the content. And I don't think that those audiences were as they were responsive. responsive, but I think as when Charlie Atlas's film got on there, that really kind of explained it. You've got the choreographers explaining it, but it's it it it, give, it gives you a, a, a way in, mm. and then you've got something to hang this material sure. on. And some of it is I I mean I've seen it a million times. Some of the pieces are boring right. after a while. You know right. they you just. Yeah. Think, oh my God! And then something happens, and it clicks, and you go with it, and it's all fine. And yeah. and that some nights it's better than others for me. Um, but then there's something else coming, and right. there's it's a big program. Sure. There's right. a, lot a lot of, of a lot of material, and uh, and the dancers are really having fun with it. I right. think they're going to be really sorry when they're not doing it anymore. Uh -huh. Well, they are actually, they're touring Europe right now, and they're they're doing it in some places and not in others. Right. And I heard that. That at times Misha's just in the uh, in the house or mm -hmm. during the rehearsal process, just rem kind of in awe of how beautiful everyday yeah. movement yeah. when when yeah. the community members are right. Just oh, community up. members, you can't imagine. You're just I I have never seen so many people cry over so you know so yeah. little uh, being manipulated. Yeah. Um, there's a beautiful use of videotape in David Gordon's piece where you see the faces. <laughs> of the community people. Right. And the woman who's doing the coordinating, Nancy Duncan. Nancy Duncan, has done a fabulous job. So I've seen it now in, in Princeton. We were trying it out. Right. They had people from a homeless shelter. You didn't, there was no sign on them, said, sure. you know, but there were women and her, their children and, and all different kinds of people. Um, right. And then we were in Alaska. And we had this beautiful Inuit family, sure. and um, yeah. and you and, and in Brooklyn, a man. It was Brooklyn. It was yeah. incredible. Oh, that's great. And you you and then after you've seen them in Steve's piece and David's piece, and then there's a wonderful sort of finale. You feel like you kind of gotten to know right. these people. Sure. It's really wonderful, and the way they move and how they've chosen to dress themselves, and um, right. huh. I think that that vernacular movement is is. And, and Steve talks about that in his piece. He said, I don't know what made us do this. I don't know. It's boring to look at some of it. I don't know why we, we insisted on this. He says that on did, video. Yes, uh -huh. he says this on uh -huh. the video. Well, you know, one of the reasons we were also, aside from uh, my having a short history with Misha and White Oak, and, but also um, our real... Um, interest in uh, the history here at, at the Walker and the artists that you supported during your time here, even before you became coordinator, but afterward, and then the ongoing history of, with, with artists like Tricia, mm -hmm. Lucinda. Uh, oh, I think David that, Gordon, yes, all the people that have been here after me have just done kind of incredible work here. Through, you know, I hope I've. This is great. This okay, is good. Perfect, yeah. I'm having um, fun. It's really just about um, the chance, like you said, 
to see some of these originating kind of the almost the seeds of postmodernism mm -hmm. that now I think our dance audiences here in the Twin Cities and Walker audiences have come to be seen as second nature like mm -hmm. a lot of these innovations mm -hmm. people still as Misha has said uh, artists that we've supported regularly Meg Stewart mm -hmm. John Jaspers uh, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. Terry O'Connor there they none of them would probably be working in the way they do now if it hadn't been for these oh I, I think so and they and they all come right. to these performances yeah. it'd be amazing how many uh, people have come you know to uh, on the road and all of that too right. uh, yeah I think that they've they've all and it's interesting that they've all gone on to do you know different Is kinds of things uh, yes yeah. uh, and uh, th but but um, I just kind of lost my thought. But yeah. Well, I, I just wondered if there was any, um, I know we talked right when the project was just getting started. Mm -hmm. Sam Miller and I have talked mm -hmm. a number of times about it, but um, if there's any personal perspective um, the, from your end about Pass Forward coming to Minneapolis. Oh, for me, it's like a, a great homecoming to think about. I, I've, I'm so old now that when that the strands of my life start converging in various yeah. places and that's the that 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 makes up for <laughs> any anything else because it, it's really the best in, in a way it makes it the best part of life and my life's my lives are always converging now I, it's just amazing to me so for this it has been so much fun for me because Misha's been a uh, a, a sort of pocket here and then right. all of those people and I've stayed in touch I'm very close to David Gordon I'm uh, chairman of his board well, of the pickup yeah. company and right. and I kept in touch with you know many of these people and then as I say some of them are, are legends and I didn't yeah. that I didn't know but it's uh, and and you know we talked about vernacular but also there's silence and the music and, and some of the music is difficult and people didn't uh, you know, now audiences are kind of nothing really shocks them yeah, very much right. anymore. So they're they're ready. It's like you know we talked. Phil Glass came here in 1970, and nobody came. And he and Steve Reich came. I mean, nobody Remember was coming in New were York. Six people in the audience and nine on stage. Or something. Right, something like that. My <laughs> husband was one of them, and he right. left. I think. I mean, you know, and he loved Phil Glass ultimately. But you know, it takes some getting used to. Right. And now, of course, it's in. You hear that music ripped off for commercials. Sure. I mean, right. so it's been fun to see how far that's come. It's also been fun to see how the Walker has taken on this role of continuing to push the vanguard, and sometimes that means going back. Right. And if there's anything that's made me happy since I left here is, I mean, I loved working here more. That was the best time of my life. I've never had more fun, and I've never worked harder. I've never had more fun um, than I had those years that I was here. So when I left, I mean that was um, that was sort of handing over something that I I didn't start from whole cloth, but I had really, really developed yeah. it. And um, everybody that's come has made it better, uh -huh. and I haven't had one pang of uh -huh. of uh, re, you know regret right. or or envy or or so, being right. annoyed of yeah. something anybody's been doing. Right. But Nigel came after me, and then I didn't know Bob Stern very well, and then I watched Kalaki, and sure. now you. And it, and I'm not doing this to be, uh, to, 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 you know, to be gratuitous here, but the fact is, it, it, it has always reflected the, the museum and, or the art center and, and this community. And the other thing about that is I, I was so spoiled here because this is the best audience in America. I still think. Uh, I really do. Yeah. I think it's the most open. If it doesn't like something, it lets you know, but it listens right. and it pays attention. And I mean, I've had so many times I've, in this hall, somebody screaming bullshit at, right. you know, this group <laughs> called Fah, and all of these people that came here, or John and Merce, or, right, you know, sure. all of that. But, but that's okay. Yeah. But, but mostly, people are really open they're really smart and they're really open right. and they listen and they watch and they react and they don't have to wait till the reviewer tells them right. whether it was good or not it's yeah. a very sophisticated audience and you don't see that many places still right and that's i think one of the great joys of um, bringing past forward is that i think it will also yeah. allow people to kind of revel in, in the history that they've been part of but right. also really right. have the chance to see some of these right. great works. Right, right. Because having worked with Misha as much as I have, I mean, there's there's a lot of people who, even though, no matter how much you tell them that he is not going to wear boots and, right. you know, leap onto the stage right. anymore, yeah, yeah. 
that that they that's what they still want you know they want Giselle or something right. and so there's always a there, there's a certain group of the ladies I call that got to see them once before they die people right. and and that's not who's coming to this no. yeah. it's a very it's a very savvy audience yeah. and and the, and I think it one of the things that makes it successful is that he's having so much fun mm -hmm. I mean that just is that comes through obviously. oh yeah. yeah oh yeah he's beside himself he's huh. having such a good time oh, with great. his people well, so. Suzanne, thank you so much for taking the time. It was my time. pleasure. So. Thank you.